Amen. So like I said, we are in the midst of a new sermon series for us called Before You Give Up. So today we're going to be in the book of Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, as I've learned to pronounce it. I, there's a right way, there's a wrong way. I'm going to go with my way, okay? <laughs> and um, Habakkuk is how I'm going to pronounce it, okay? But Habakkuk is a short book in the Bible. Um, it's not a very fun one, all right? Like, if you're looking for major points of encouragement, this is not the book that you're supposed to be in. Because um, it's actually set in one of the worst times in the nation of Judah. The good king, Josiah, had died, and King Jehezekim, an evil king, uh, the book of Jeremiah will tell you uh, more about him, has taken over. Okay, One of the book's major themes, similar to Jeremiah, Job, and Psalms, is doubt and disappointment. While all would benefit from reading this book in its entirety, and you could, in like 30 minutes or less. Because again, it's a short book. For the sake of our message, we're going to concentrate on virtually the first full chapter of it. It is here that Habakkuk comes in, as some would say, coming in hot. Okay? He says to the Lord in his prayer, How long? Will you ignore us and do nothing, God? Why am I in this awful place, seeing devastation and violence all around me? You can see that in verses 2 and 3. It feels like, maybe this makes sense to you, God has left the chat. Okay? Like God has removed himself in what? Habakkuk is trying to say from the conversation. Habakkuk misses no words. Again, I was referencing a little bit about the news. Maybe you are acknowledging, seeing just the utter chaos that is going on all around the world, let alone in our own country. To be certain, in this piece of scripture, the situation is bad. Habakkuk is not exaggerating. Violence occurs six times in Habakkuk. And usually a large number of times. It's an unusual amount of times for such a small book. Okay? The Hebrew word means more than just physical brutality. Okay? It refers to the flagrant violation of moral law by which someone injures his fellow man. So it's not just like basic war. It is like the utter breaking of what is going on around, period. It is any ethical wrong and physical violence is only one of the manifestations that are happening within this book. By piling up symptoms for injustice, Habakkuk stresses the severity of the oppression that existed in Judah at that time. God answers, but it's not great news. But here is what it says. God is doing something. Amen. Yes. Ah, that's kind of crazy, right? Like, just rest in that for a second. Like, in the midst of all the yucky. Do you know yucky is a Greek word? <laughs> okay? All the yucky that was going on. In the midst, God is still up to something. Amen. He is raising up the worst of the worst to bring judgment over Judah. That sounds even worse from our perspective, as if things weren't already bad enough, their enemies were going to come and invade. As judgment. And yet God is still up to something. Habakkuk asks another hard question. He acknowledges God's character as the Holy One. And wonders aloud how he could allow more violence to occur. By the hands of people even more evil than Judah. Sorry. 
That's a pretty similar question that I guarantee you've asked. If God is such a loving, good God, why has happened? Why has X, Y, Z, L, M, N, O, P happened in our lives? Why have we seen the suffering of children? Why have we seen the brokenness of poverty and the destruction of what goes on around us? No intervention by the divine rule. In fact, in this part of scripture, it was survival of the fittest. The big violent nations rule as they obliterate the smaller nations like Judah. He hangs his head asking God to make it all make sense. <clears throat> You ever gotten to that point in your life when there's so much messiness? God, just make sense of it. Because, like, again, a pastor can say God is up to something. And some people will say amen because some people are able to muddle through the mess. I don't know about you. Anybody like swimming in a lake? We're a little bit closer to lakes than we are the ocean here in Pittsburgh area. You know in the summertime when you are swimming in said lake and seaweed touches your foot? <laughs> Not seaweed, but you know what I'm talking about, that grass. And you start to wade through it, and it's kind of nasty. But if you get through it, you find some good stuff. This book continues, and God answers, but with no simpler explanation Things are about to actually get worse before they get better. The third chapter concludes the book of Habakkuk with a heartbreaking prayer. He is not blind to the pain and suffering that is about to intensify, but his prayer is reminiscent of Psalm 77. He recalls what God has done in the past and settles into a quietly resigned type of faith. Does that make sense? Like that deep breath of like, okay. Like when you don't really have those words, that God is going to see him through. Or God is going to see the people through. Or that God will see me through. That situational thing that has me white-knuckled that has me on the edge of my seat, that has me so anxious, hurt, and broken that I... And then you finally... God is faithful, even in Habakkuk's doubts. Amen. Like the man in Mark chapter 9, verse 24, he moves forward because of his belief of God's power and goodness even when it seems impossible to believe wholeheartedly. That kind of stuff happens in the New Testament a lot. From like kids being sick at a far off distance and people coming before Jesus and being like, listen, I heard you do really cool things. You don't even have to show up in a place and you show up in a place. Would you do that for me? Are we honest about our doubts? Habakkuk is not paralyzed by his doubts, but he is honest about them. Again, are we honest about our doubts? Some Christians have formed the idea that Christianity and the Christian life are furnished. Oh, that's good stuff. With flowers, tranquility. Tranquility, sweet colored glasses, like you come to Jesus, everything is just better. There's no more trouble, there's no more chaos in the world. When faced with difficulties and tragedies, they start to wonder about the strength and the validity of their faith. And it benefits them in such circumstances to express to God in all honesty. The transparency of how we actually feel. God, I am confused. God, I am, in fact, hurting. 
Whether it's a question, a complaint, or disappointment, doubt, or feelings of despair, it would benefit us to learn from Habakkuk. Like I said, you might not like to read. Guess what? You really can read this book 30 minutes or less. Just throwing that out there. And like I said, you're not going to find immense amounts of positivity within it, but you're going to see God work through the muddle and the muck of what's going on. It would benefit us to learn from Habakkuk that God wants them to share, wants us to share all that we think, all that we feel, whether we consider that it's steaming from faith or even just a little tiny bit of faith or even a complete lack of faith of whatever's going on. There's a song by an artist named John Foreman. John Foreman is the lead singer of a band called Switchfoot. Okay? And the song is called Jesus, I Have My Dads. Here's what it says. Here's the lyrics to the song. Jesus, I'm sorry about last night. Singing these broken songs, looking for the life for so long, but the pain goes on and on and on. Can you reach me here in the silence? Jesus, has the world gone mad? Jesus, what a week we've had. Jesus feels like my world's in pieces. I know you've got your reasons, but I've got my doubts. Jesus, I've got my doubts. So are you there? Can you hear me? Do you care? Are you near me? Because I'm scared and I'm weary. Are you there? Can you hear me? Are you there? I have my doubts. See, behind this song, here's like a quote from John Foreman, okay? So that's like a pretty deep song. That's like a real reckoning that has almost guaranteed happened to us. Here's what John Foreman says about the song he wrote. I do not believe in a God who is afraid of my questions. I do not believe in a God who is afraid of me. Because a God that cannot be questioned doesn't sound like a God at all. Part of believing is to doubt, to ask, to seek, to knock, and ultimately to find. For I stand at the door knocking. Maybe we are far too reserved with our God. Or our, is our God too delicate? Or are we? This is a song that steps into the ring with God that we just read from. Asking the very big questions at the end of a long and difficult season. This song is my honest attempt to sing into my doubts. John. Tim Keller, an author, writes, Faith without some doubts is like a human body without any antibodies in it. People who, are, who, who have literally gone through life, who are too busy or too indifferent to ask hard questions about what they believe as they do will find themselves defenseless against either the experience of tragedy or the probing questions of a smart skeptic. A person's faith can collapse almost overnight if he or she has failed over the years to listen, listen patiently to their own doubts, which should only be discarded after a long reflection of what's going on within you. On Mondays, I often sit and I listen about, how, how is it pronounced? The, your, per, that's not your personal God. How do we pronounce it? The higher power of your believing. Something along that line, right? I listen to the doubts of what has happened, and I also hear some people really trust in a program that seems to work well. I often, uh, uh, not often, this last week, if you noticed when you're driving in, I, I tried to update our sign, but if it looks a little bit off-centered, it's because I am, okay? <laughs> and um, it's really hard to do that. I gotta rest the lid of it on my head to put them on, so you get what you get. But 
The saying on that sign blew my mind on Monday. It was somebody talking about their doubts and what has been going on in their lives. And they're like, man, I'm upset because I feel like I've taken a step back. And I feel like in stepping back, I have failed. And this other individual within the meeting said, whoa! And I was like, ooh, this is going to be good. Because he really stopped them almost mid-sentence. He's like, taking a step back isn't failing. It's getting a running start. And I was like, whoa, come on, man. That's some cool stuff. I could preach on that. And so I did. <laughs> Believers should acknowledge and wrestle with doubts. Not only their own, but their friends and their neighbors. Our doubts are not barriers to faith. It needs a running start. They can strengthen our faith. Even more so when we share openly with trustworthy people in our faith communities and in our communities, period, right? In like the collection of people whom you trust and you love. They strengthen our communal faith as the body of Christ. Let's be really real. The Bible includes things that are hard to believe and perceive and apply. There are some uniquely weird things in the Bible. In fact, we talked about that today in Sunday school. We were talking about Ezekiel's definition of angelic beings. If you want to find something interesting, Google this, not now, after service. <laughs> Type in Ezekiel's definition of angels, and then click images. Woo! There is a real reason why when angels showed up, they said, hey, don't be afraid, because they're terrifying. Okay? Check it out all on your own. It seems the more you know, often the less that you understand. Mountains of textual criticisms, different interpretations, and studies are available more than we could ever, 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 ever read in a lifetime. You can find a commentary, an exegetical paper, or something about anything you want. Cultural considerations add nuances to passages that we likely we like to reduce to a very literal interpretation. We can overinterpretate something. Denominational differences within the global church illustrates that we do not all agree on everything. There's one thing I hope we all agree on. Jesus is Lord. Amen. And that's okay. This does not mean we no longer study or invest in our own pursuit of biblical knowledge. I really encourage you to do so. You don't believe me in some of the things I say? Read it for yourself. I didn't write this stuff. I didn't write this big book. There is a lot of room between the goalposts of faith with a lot of diversity within the global church. Searching the scriptures daily can help us grow in our understanding of God and in our relationship with Him. Amen. When you are struggling, choosing to hide from your troubles, to ignore and pretend everything is fine, it rarely leads to healing. You catch that? When we hide and we pretend that nothing is wrong, it rarely actually lends to us healing. How can our congregation cultivate a culture where people can ask honest questions and be met with grace and understanding? How could that build our faith individually and communally? Research shows that doubt is not the biggest hindrance to a young person's faith. But silence around it is. When we choose not to answer. By making room for the hard questions, we allow God to work in and through us. How is it even possible to then have faith without doubt? 
God's favorites are not immune from the bewildering times when God seems silent. As Paul Turner said, where there is no longer any opportunity for doubt, there is no longer any opportunity for faith either. Faith demands uncertainty. The Bible includes many proofs of God's concern in some um, quite spectacular type of manners, but no guarantees. A guarantee, after all, would preclude faith. If you are sitting here today feeling as though you have it all together, you have no doubts, you have no struggles, get ready because I'm going to hang out with you. <laughs> Take a moment to consider if the God you are following is the one of your own making or the ones of Scripture. If our lives and his fit neatly into a box with no mystery, with no awe. Chances are that we have become someone who is out of touch with both God and our neighbor. God asked this question earlier last week about, said, Pastor, what is worship to you? And I was in a room with other pastors and I listened to them. And they had great answers. Not like flowery, ex like ex expressive, but just good answers. And I was last to share, and they would go, okay, Pastor, what, what's your answer? And I just said yes. People don't like when I do that. <laughs> I do that often. Would you like peanut butter pie or chocolate peanut butter sheet pie cake? And I say, yes. <laughs> yes, please. I don't want to make a decision. In some instances, in this, what is worship? I say, yes. Because I can't define that perfectly other than it's for God. Every time somebody in Scripture, and often when I find throughout the Old Testament, they're trying to box up God, he blows that box out of the water. Even to the point when he speaks to Moses, when Moses is asking Listen, Lord, who do I tell them you are that sent me to do these things? And he goes, just tell them I am. That's not a real answer, God. No, it really is. Because when we are desiring a God who is peace, God goes, oh, I am. But when we're asking for a God who is full of grace, oh, I am. Well, Lord, I need a Lord that is full of love because I'm having a hard time loving myself. And he goes, well, I am. And so that's what I read when I see it, like in this like box, you can't put it in. He's got way too many names. That's what makes him, I am. Like Habakkuk, we cannot turn a blind eye to the struggles around us, nor can we manipulate the God of the universe to our will. Even in asking, like, Lord, I need your peace. I am. I'll show it to you. We don't abandon God when times are tough. And we don't follow him only when circumstances are good. If like Habakkuk, we can press on, however, pathetically during our darkest of times... At our darkest of days, we often find God amidst it. Like when we genuinely open our eyes to look and see and appreciate what's going on. If we are paying attention, we will in fact struggle. But we can pray, we can love, and we can serve a hurting world that's around us both in and outside the walls of the church as we trudge forward in faith. Have you ever hiked with a group of children? Good. I haven't either. In fact, that sounds like a nightmare. It goes one of two ways, though. The first possibility is that the kids have a great time and are completely distracted by nature and 
one another that it feels like you reach the end of the record of the hype in the perfect amount of time. The second possibility is that it's a complete whiny disaster. This is especially common if it's hot outside, the kids are hungry or thirsty, or someone has a blister. <laughs> now, I don't know if I've expressed this illustration, but back in college, my friends and I, I could call us children in this fact, we made a very foolish decision that in February we were going to go hiking and camping and, uh, on Mount Greylock in New Hampshire. <laughs> That's the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> One, because I got no business hiking in the spring, the fall, or the winter. But we decided to go. We got all our stuff, we got our tent, we got all this. And when we were driving up, it, it had melted a little bit, the snow, and then it froze really quick. So it was like a solid sheet of ice, too. And we had pulled into this park, and the game warden, the park ranger, comes up and goes, what are you doing here? We're like, we're going hiking and camping. He said, please don't. I don't want to rescue you. I said, no, we're good. We, we have this. I even have burgers in this bag. We're going to make burgers when we get to the top of this. Multiple mile ice hike. Let me tell you. In the spring, it would take you 15 minutes to get to where we wanted to go. In February, it took us three hours. Okay? The struggle was extremely real, and I'm very certain that it wasn't worth it. <laughs> Most group leaders will nurse the kids along until there is a reward. This was my friend Grant. Whether that be a break or, um, or just saying, hey, I can hear the wind stopping. It's just around the corner. Do you know how many times my buddy Graham told me it was just around the corner? <laughs> hey, 15 minutes, Tim. I'm like, oh, I bet. I said some of the worst things to my friends that I think I've ever said in my life. <laughs> how much further? Can we just stop here? Is it just around this corner or just another mile more? And when the kids or our group of friends arrive at the destination, they realized pressing on was actually worth it. I don't know that that was entirely true <laughs> when we got to the peak of Mount Greylock. Because it was cloudy. We couldn't see anything. <laughs> and it was snowing and raining. Again, we were wet. We were tired, hungry. We busted out this stove thing that we hiked up, my buddy hiked up with, and fell like 150 times. He broke it. <laughs> But we made some of the best burgers we feel like we've ever eaten. When we are tempted to give up because we cannot see the forest for the trees, God is whispering to you, maybe just one more mile. It is difficult to face the hardships that life, that this life on earth brings, but God is asking us to trust him and take the next steps. My buddy was very gracious and humble in tricking us. That it was only 10 more minutes in this three and a half hour hike. <laughs> we don't have to know where we are going to make it to the mountaintop. We just have to know that our leader will get us there whatever the conditions of the trail. And for that, I remain thankful. That even in seasons of doubt, I pray that you realize that you live in the truth that God is truly amidst us. Amen. And the chaos that you will, in fact, see over these next couple weeks throughout the news, God will show up. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you. For you hear us, you know us, and you are working within us. Father, teach us your will. Teach us what you have planned. And when it seems too crazy for us to try to focus on you, may you remind us that you, in fact, are. For you are good, and we love you. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 Hey, you are loved 
and it's best say hi to somebody, shake their hand, unless you've got a cold, don't touch anything. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.